الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل إن كنتم تحبون الله فاتبعوني يحببكم الله ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم والله غفور رحيم وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كل أمة يدخلون الجنة إلا من أبا قيل ومن يأبا يا رسول الله قال من أطاعني دخل الجنة ومن عصاني فقد أبا وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فمن رغب عن سنتي فليس مني أو كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم Most respected on my Kiram, brothers and elders. There's one very well-known incident about Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jailani, rahmatullah alayhi. Perhaps it was Sheikh Junaid Baghdadi, rahmatullah alayhi. Sheikh Junaid Baghdadi, rahmatullah alayhi. One woman came to him one day and she said she wanted to ask something. So she was fully dressed in Islamic attire. She was in her niqab. And she requested to ask something, but without anybody else overhearing it. So he stood aside, others were all present. And then she asked what she wanted to ask. And then suddenly, to the amazement of everybody, they were unable to hear what was the conversation, what was the discussion. But suddenly they just see him falling and he fainted. So when he fainted, this woman also quickly went away. Others who were there, they quickly came and attended to him. After a short while, he regained consciousness. So they asked him, what happened? What did that lady say that had such an effect on you that you fainted? You fell unconscious. So he says, well, she came to ask something. What she came to ask was that... Is it permissible for a husband to take a second wife? So I said definitely, because that is the law of Sharia, that yes, a person, a man can take a second, a third, up to a fourth wife, provided that he can maintain equality between all the various aspects that have to be taken care of, is not something just to be just trivialized and some kind of pastime. In any case, that's not the subject. The point is that I gave the answer that yes, this is permissible. So then she said, but had it been permissible for me to expose my face to you, then I would have exposed my face to you. I would have lifted this niqab and shown the beauty that Allah Ta'ala has blessed me with. And then you tell me that a husband that has been blessed with a wife that has this kind of beauty is it still right for him to be looking elsewhere? So he says when she said this, now she just expressed her, whatever was in her heart, it's got nothing to do with any mas'ala, any ruling of deen. She was obviously very anxious now that the husband is going to be taking a second wife, but now she came and expressed herself in this manner. In that moment, something bubbled up. So she said, if Allah Ta'ala had made it permissible, then I would have shown you what beauty Allah has blessed me with. And then you tell me whether it's right for a husband who has been blessed with a wife like myself, who has such beauty, to be still looking elsewhere. So then they asked him, so what, so what does that, how does that fit in with what happened? That you fell unconscious. So he replied and said that my mind went to this, that if on the day of Qiyamah Allah Ta'ala asks me that I was the creator of all beauty, I was the grantor and the benefactor of everything. I was the, your khaliq and your creator. I was your sustainer. I was your nourisher. I granted you everything. And despite that, you still turned your attention to ghayrullah. You turned your attention to others. You turned your attention to those who were opposing me. So what answer will I give when this one woman can't tolerate that her husband looks elsewhere because she has extraordinary beauty, 
then how am I going to face Allah Ta'ala that I didn't give my total focus to Allah Ta'ala, whereas Allah is my benefactor, Allah is the creator of all beauty. So this had such an impact on my heart that I fell unconscious. Now this is an incident of a very pious person, what impact this had on his heart. But now in the same vein, this gives us something to ponder over. That just as we should have our entire focus towards Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, Allah who is our creator, who is our sustainer, who is our nourisher, Allah who is the one who has blessed us with everything, every breath that we take is purely His grace and mercy. Every morsel of food that we eat which digests and which provides that nourishment is purely His gift and bounty. Anything and everything is from Him. So we should have our entire focus towards worshipping Allah Ta'ala alone and being obedient to Him. Similarly, it is Allah Ta'ala who has blessed us with Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the greatest Rasul of Allah Ta'ala, ta the greatest of Allah Ta'ala's creation, the one who Allah Ta'ala blessed with every kind of excellence, who was blessed with excellence beyond our imagination and unparalleled, nobody can come close to it. Excellence in every facet and every aspect of life. Excellence in his ruhaniyat and spirituality where the entire ummah and the entire humanity at large and all the anbiya alayhi salatu wa salam, all the sahaba kiram, all the awliya of the ummah, all put together, they cannot come to a fraction to the greatness of the spirituality and the maqam of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Allah ta'ala blessed him with that great position ba'adas khuda buzruk tu ee qissa mukhtasar that after Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala the maqam and the position is of none but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa this is the crux of it in terms of his maqam and position then Allah ta'ala blessed him with the most perfect and most beautiful akhlaq and character wa innaka la ala khuluqin azim in the Quran Sharif Allah ta'ala endorses this that indeed you are on the peak of good character and akhlaq and Allah Ta'ala blessed him with excellence in every other aspect in his physical being. Allah Ta'ala blessed him with excellence that cannot be imagined. Hazrat Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu says that on one occasion I came out, it was a moonlit night. Kharajtu fi laylatin idhiyan. It was a moonlit night, a full moon shining. And suddenly there I see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is also standing outside. And I started looking for ja'altu anzuru ilayhi wa ilal qamar. I would glance at the Mubarak face of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I would look at his Mubarak countenance, and then I would look at the moon, doing some kind of comparison. That the moon in all its glory, its shining 14th moon, and I'm looking at the Mubarak face of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And after doing this a few times, my heart testified, "Falahu wa ahsanu indi min al qamar." That indeed, Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam was more beautiful than the moon also. Sayyidina Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, وَمَا مَسِسْتُ دِبَاجًا وَلَا حَرِيرًا أَلْيَنَ مِنْ كَفِّ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم I never touched any silk, silk which is the softest material that one can find. I never touched any silk which was more soft than the Mubarak palm of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. وَمَا شَمِمْتُ رَائِحَةً أَتْيَبَ مِنْ رَائِحَةِ النَّبِيِّ صلى الله عليه وسلم I never smelt any fragrance. More sweet smelling than the natural fragrance of the body of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now these are just some little examples, little meaning, one few examples of what excellence Allah wa Taala blessed Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in every aspect, unparalleled, unmatched. Forget unparalleled and unmatched. The entire humanity can get together. The angels can get together and they can't reach a fraction of this excellence. Now just as that incident we spoke about, Junaid Baghdadi, this woman came and she was unable to fathom how can this be, that she has so much of beauty and her husband is still looking elsewhere. And as a result, she had this real pain in her heart that Allah Ta'ala blessed me with so much of beauty and my husband is still looking elsewhere. Now this is a moment of reflection for us that Allah Ta'ala blessed us with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
blessed us with that Nabi who is perfect in every regard. And then blessed us with that Nabi who Allah Ta'ala gave him such a way of life. And gave him such a manner in every aspect of life. That Allah Ta'ala himself declares in the Quran Sharif, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا That indeed in the messenger of Allah Ta'ala wa ta is the most splendid example for you. Allah Ta'ala blessed Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi with the most perfect example of and way of life. So Allah Ta'ala blessed him with every excellence physically, spiritually, in every aspect and facet of life, in his Mubarak ways and manner and habits, and in everything. And then Allah Ta'ala blessed us with that opportunity, with that bounty, with that grace and mercy to be in the Ummah of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if on the day of Qiyamah, our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has to ask us that Allah Ta'ala made you my Ummati and Allah Ta'ala made me the perfect being from all of humanity and beyond all the angels also. Allah Ta'ala blessed me with all the perfection physically, spiritually. Allah blessed me with that example which Allah Himself endorsed. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا so I came to you with this most perfect way of life. And then in order to pass it on to you, I undertook every sacrifice that had to be made. I saw every kind of difficulty and hardship and I took it in my stride. Why? So that my beautiful way of life, the deen that I brought, that could reach you and you too could be successful in dunya and akhirat. So Allah Ta'ala blessed you to be in the ummah of the most perfect Nabi, with the most perfect way of life. What attracted you in somebody else? What attraction you found in the West? What disinclination you had in my way of life? How come you didn't find that attraction that Allah, Allah Ta'ala put in everything that Allah Ta'ala granted me? What made you still look in the ways of others? and find something appealing in their way of life. If such an an question is asked to us on the day of Qiyamah, what answer do we have? Can we give any answer? And Allah Ta'ala puts this question to us, I sent my beloved Nabi to you, and he made every sacrifice. He saw his Sahaba Kiram being martyred. He had to tie stones to his Mubarak belly out of extreme hunger, just in order to pass on this message of deen, so that it could reach you someday. That he went from person to person in Mina, May Yawini, Mayan Suruni, Hatta Ubaliga Risalata Rabbi, that these people of Makkah Mukarrama have now tortured me too much. I need some place, I need some refuge somewhere. Where I can from which place I can now pass on the message of my Rabb. Not so that I can sit with peace. I need some refuge, some people to help. For what? So that my Ummatis who will come later in the 20th century or 14 centuries later, those Ummatis also must get my message. They too must learn what is my Sunnah. They too must learn what is the, what is the most beautiful way of life. And they too must gain success in dunya and akhirat. So Allah Ta'ala asks us on that day that I sent my beloved Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to you. What appreciation you showed that his Mubarak way of life reached you. This was preserved and passed on from generation to generation and it reached you as well. And his most beautiful example was presented. But how did you respond to it? Did you conduct yourself in his Mubarak way? Did you have some iota of that concern for deen that he had? Did you adopt his Mubarak Sunnah in all your ways? Or did you find some attraction in the ways of the West which was directly opposed to the Mubarak way of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? You found something better in their appearance. You found something better in the way they hold their, have their weddings. You found something better in their manner of business. You found something better in all the other things and you didn't find that attraction in what my Nabi came with. So we find that this is a thing that we have to ponder on in the month of Rabi'ul Awal. Generally, we hear the Mubarak Seerah of Rasulullah over and over again 
Indeed, the Mubarak seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is something very dear to us. It should be very close to our hearts, and it's not confined for the month of Rabi' ul Awal. It is a part of every day of a mu'min, because a mu'min he cannot live his life without the Mubarak seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because that is his guide, that is his example. So it's not something for a specific month or a specific day. It is all year round, every day that we live the Mubarak seerah. And we learn about the Mubarak Sirah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam as well. Unfortunately, it's a very big tragedy that sometimes we know more about people who have no iman also, let alone others people who have no iman. We know more about their lives, about their issues, than we know about the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, than we know about the Mubarak life of Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself. We've read about the. Biographies of cricketers and footballers and who not, and many a young person and Allah knows best old old person also will be able to give us the entire names of the entire cricket teams and rugby teams and soccer teams and Allah knows best what are the teams, but about the personality of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, sometimes basic things also we are unaware of. Many years back, I once asked one youngster out of the blue. He was talking something, so I asked him that uh, the Wimbledon something about Wimbledon was carrying on at that time. So I asked him who's number one in this whole Wimbledon Wimbledon thing you're talking about. So he gave the name, and then the second, number th- two, and number three, and up to number ten, he's just rattling off the names without any hesitation, without thinking twice. So ten names of kufar, people don't have iman. People who are prancing around naked, in total shamelessness, and he knows their names, and he's happy to know about their names. And then I asked him how many daughters did Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have? He got the wrong number. And what were their names? He knew the name of one only. Now this is the comparison, and we have to stand in front of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the day of Qiyamah. This is one person's example, but it's meant for us to reflect upon ourselves. What do we know? How much of time we've taken to read the Mubarak Sirah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? We've read what not social media. How many words we're reading every day? Let us look at our screen time. And if you add all those screen time hours in one month, how many hours it will probably reach? And in one year, how many hundreds of hours? How many hours out of that we took out to read the Mubarak Sirah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? How many hours of that we took out to recite Duru Sharif upon Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? This is Rabi' ul Awal. This is Sirat, and Rabi' ul Awal is a month in the year. This is for every day of the year. Meaning, the lesson is this: it's not something confined for one part of the year. Otherwise, unfortunately, our whole approach to the Mubarak Sunnah is this: that well, this is Sunnah, it's not Farz and Wajib. Which is a very dangerous. The tone of this is very dangerous for Zaman, because it tends to trivialize the Mubarak way of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Sahaba Ikram understood what is the value of Sunnah. Hazrat Umm Habiba radhiyallahu taala anha, she says that one one occasion I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam mention the virtue of one amal. That man salla ithnate ashara ta rakatan fi yomin wa leilatin buniya lahu bihinna baytun fil janna. The one who makes twelve rakats in the day and night, twelve rakats referring to the twelve rakats which is termed as a sunnatul muakkada, the two sunnats of Fajr, the four sunnats before Zohar, the two after Zohar, and likewise the two sunnats after Maghrib, the two after Isha. This adds on to twelve rakats. Now this is the sunnatul muakkada. Apart from that is a sunnatul ghair muakkada, which is also very important. But this should never be compromised at any time. So now Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave the virtue of this that the person who makes these twelve rakats daily, then Allah Taala will grant him a palace in Jannah. Now, Umm Habiba radhiyallahu anha heard this. So now what did she say? Well, it's Sunnah, and well, so it doesn't really matter if I leave it out. She is narrating this long after Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and she is saying, "Fama taraktuhu mundu samiyatuhu min Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam." That I never left this out from the day I heard Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say this. 
That day and today, decades have passed, I haven't left it out once. Then the person who is narrating this hadith from her, Amba Sabi Nabi Sufyan, he says that فَمَا تَرَكْتُهُنَّ مُنْدُ سَمِعْتُهُنَّ مِنْ مِنْ أَبِي أُمِّ حَبِيبَةَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهَا That from the day I heard Ummi Habiba رضي الله عنها narrate this hadith, from that day to this day I didn't leave it out once. And then somebody who is narrating it from Amba Sabi Nabi Sufyan, Amr ibn Aus, Rahimahullah, he says from the day I heard Amba Sabi Nabi Sufyan narrate this hadith, and give this virtue of these 12 rakats in the day, from that day to this day in my life, I haven't missed out on a single day this. And then Nu'man bin Salim who then relates from Amr ibn Aus, the same hadith, he then comments and he says it to his students, from the day I, meant, I heard this hadith from Amr ibn Aus, to this day, not a single day have I missed out practicing on this. Subhanallah, these people understood the value of sunnah. These people understood what is the value of following in the Mubarak footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, Sunnah is sometimes misunderstood. That Sunnah has become a very a concept that is we made it very confined. When we talk about following in the Mubarak, the following the Mubarak Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, this is his entire way of life. His entire way of life. In that, some things are even categorized as farz, some as wajib. Some as sunnat and some as ghair muakkada, something as mustahab, something as nafil. But everything that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, this is his way of life. This is his sunnah. And we hear one hadith sharif normally mentioned in the khutbah of the nikah. Every time that a nikah takes place, we hear this hadith sharif. This hadith is part of a lengthy hadith. There were three sahaba, very, very enthusiastic young people wanting to follow everything that Rasulullah did. So now they came to the azwaj mutahharat to inquire that, look, the, whatever we see Nabi Islam outside, outdoors, in public, that we have already learned. But we are not aware of his, his life indoors. So they came to inquire, what is his ibadat for the night? They expected that the entire night from beginning to end, Nabi Islam was standing in salah. What about his fasting? that you can't see whether a person is fasting or not. Perhaps every day he was fasting, etc. So they came to inquire. So the Azwadi Mutaharat, whoever they asked from, they gave them the details that Nabi Islam would stand up, he would rest for a while, then he would stand up at half the night, and then he would perform salah for a lengthy period, and the last one-sixth of the night he would take a small rest again, and various other details. He would fast on some days, he would keep, he would make iftar on some days. So these Sahaba, after hearing all this, they didn't discuss among themselves. They said, after all, that is the Nabi of Allah, wa ta'ala. He is masoom, he is sinless. In other words, if he doesn't uh, make ibadat the entire night, he spends part of the night resting also, it doesn't matter. After all, he's masoom. If he doesn't fast every day, he's masoom, he's sinless. We cannot afford to be doing anything less. So one person said, I... I am going to make salah the entire night. I'm not going to sleep ever. And the other person said, wa asumu wa la uftir. I'm going to fast every day of the year. I'm not going to leave one single day out. The third person said, wa la atazawajun nisa. I'm not going to ever get married. So I can dedicate my entire life to ibadat. Nabi Islam came to know about it. That these people discussed this. He came to them and he asked them, you said these kind of things? So they said, yes. In other words, you are masum, you are sinless. You don't make ibadat the entire night, it's fine for you, not for us. Nabi Islam says, Inni akhshakum lillahi wa atqakum. That I am the most, I have the greatest taqwa and the greatest fear of Allah wa ta'ala. Inni a'lamukum billah. The one who recognizes Allah ta'ala the most is me. And Allah blessed me with the most beautiful example. Asumu wa, ar- asumu wa uftir. I, some days I fast, some days I don't fast also. Meaning in the rest of the year, Ramadan is farz. So there were Mondays and Thursdays, Nabi Islam also kept fast, always fasted generally. Other days as well in the week, three days in the month, in the middle part of the month, etc. But there were days where he didn't fast as well. He performed part of the night salah, part of the night he rested as well. And he said, Wa atazawwajun nisa, I married as well. And Nabi Islam, then on this occasion, after giving this advice, said to them, Faman raghiba an sunnati falaysa minni. The one who disinclines from this way of mine. 
he wants to do something differently, then he is not part of me. Now can we imagine where this was said? That mashallah ibadat, these people had a tremendous zeal. They were so enthusiastic. But even in that ibadat, Nabi Islam said, you follow how I am doing it. You follow my way, otherwise it's not going to get that same endorsement. <coughs> now can we imagine, even in this regard, Nabi Islam cautioned them. Now what is going to be the case where somebody left the way of Nabi Islam to adopt the way of the West? Nabi Islam taught so many things in life in the most perfect manner. And somebody says, no, I'll do it how the West does it. Nabi Islam, just some few examples, time is already up. Nabi Islam thought about dressing. How to dress in loose fitting garments. Garments that cover. And the Western style is garments that expose. Everything body hugging. So now even in Ibadat, Nabi Islam moderated it. You follow my way. What are we going to answer? That your Mubarak way was this. But the way of the West, I found some attraction in that. So I took that. Your face was something, but I found attraction in somebody else's face. Your garments was how you kept it above the ankles, but I found attraction in somebody else's style. Your Mubarak way was to sit and eat, but the Western style that came to us, this became the norm, that we walk around with plate in hand and eating like Allah knows best words. So now how could we leave that out and take your way? Now these are just little, your Mubarak way was when you're eating out of a utensil, then you used to clean it and lick it clean. You should not leave one grain, one drop, and you used to say, فَإِنَّكُمْ لَا تَدْرِي فِي أَيِّ تَعَامِكُمُ الْبَرَكَةَ That you have no idea in which particle of food is the barakat. So therefore clean everything, and this is a ni'mat of Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. Don't discard a single particle of ni'mat. But the western style was you must ask for one cup of tea and drink half and waste the other half. Otherwise you are not in tune. Otherwise you are outdated. Otherwise you don't have style in you. You must ask for a glass of something to drink and you must leave three quarter or leave quarter wasted. Otherwise then you're out of style. So now we found something else now, Zubillah. What answer are we going to give to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa On the day of Qiyamah, the West is not going to come to it, come and intercede on our behalf. Nowhere else anybody is going to help. But on the day of Qiyamah, we will require the shafaat of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Already in the cover, just to finish off on this hadith sharif, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa once addressed the sahaba kiram and then he said to them, that tuftanuna fi quburikum, you are going to be tested you are going to be tested in your cover. And this test is going to be very severe. It's going to be the intensity of it is going to be close to the intensity of the fitna of the jal. Not an easy test. And then among the things that will be asked in the cover, Nabi Islam said, that it will be asked to you, وَمَا تَقُولُ فِي هَذَا rajul. What do you have to say regarding this personality? Regarding the personality of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then Nabi Islam further said, that as far as the mu'min is concerned, the true believer, the person who believed fully in Allah wa ta'ala and lived his life correctly, what he will answer, that who are Rasulullah, who are Muhammadun Rasulullah, qad ja'ana bil bayyinati wal huda. That he is the messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger of Allah wa ta'ala. He brought the clear signs to us. He brought the guidance from Allah ta'ala to us. Fa'ajabna wa taba'na. We accepted what he brought, the da'wah he came with. وَاتَّبَعْنَا And we followed him. The commentators of hadith, they write on, on this note, that this answer, this highlights, that person will be able to give the right answer, who also had ittiba' in his life. Who followed in the Mubarak footsteps of Rasulullah If he followed in the footsteps of the West, he won't be able to give this answer. وَاتَّبَعْنَا And we followed him. And on that day is not what we memorize that will speak. It is what we lived that will speak. Our actions will speak on that day. Our actions will speak in the qabr. Allah wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq that we become true followers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Not just namesake, not just in some selected things. In every aspect of life, we make our lives in accordance to his Mubarak way of life. That is where lies our success in dunya and in akhirat. وآخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين